Um, many of you, if not most of you, uh, will know Akshan Sundra, who is teaching the class this evening. Um, but for those who don't, I'll just uh, read a, a short uh, little text about her. Uh, she's originally from France. Uh, you may detect a slight French accent, uh, not too strong, very good English otherwise. Um, she was one of the first four women to join the monastic community um, at Chithurst Monastery in 1979, and uh, as an eight precept novice. Um, she became a Siladara, which means a 10 precepts arms mendicant nun in 1983 with Achan Sumedo as her preceptor. And from its inception uh, of the nuns community at Amravati, she has helped establish it and been one of the leading figures there. From 1995 to 1998, she continued her practice mostly in Thailand, uh, in the forest monasteries, and in the tradition of Achan Cha and has been teaching and leading meditation retreats worldwide for the last 30 years. And currently she resides at Amravati Buddhist Monastery, where unfortunately we can't visit her because they're in lockdown, but we're fortunate in having her on screen and leading this evening's uh, meditation and puja. We will be muted, as I say, uh, there'll be some chanting to start off with, uh, and then there'll be some sitting, but I'll basically hand over to Achan Sundra, um, who is with us here. So thank you for coming to join us uh, this evening, and uh, we look forward to, to hearing you teach. Thank you, Nick, for introducing the evening. Um, I'm very happy to be with all of you. I don't know who is around, but I feel very, very glad to be able to share a little bit of uh, what we love, what I'm sure all of you, all of you, love very much is the Dhamma, the, the, the path that takes us to a place of understanding, to a place of clarity, to a place of, uh, you know, of uh, something very inspiring in a way. So <clears throat> we are going to start by doing the chanting on page 18 of the chanting book. It's the introduction, the first part of the evening chanting describing the quality of the Buddha, yeah? So we can do this all together, okay? What I will do, I will go and light some candles behind me on my shrine, yeah? And then I'll uh, we start the chanting, yeah? So we can bow. I've got the three times, wherever you are. It's just a way of paying respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And we do the chanting together. Yo so bhagawa arahum samma sambodo sawakato ye Bhagavata Dhammo Supati Pannu Yasa Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Tamayam Bhagavantam Sadhammam Sasangam 
ime hi sakare hi atana ham halo pite hi abhi pujayam sadhu no bante bhagava sichira parini butopi pachima janata dukam pamanasa Ime sakale du gatapanna karabhute patiganhatu Amha kandi garata hitaya sukaya Arahang samma sambudho bhagava Budham bhagavantam abhivate mi Savaka to Bhagavata Dhammo Dhamma Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sanga Namami Andamaya Buddhasa Bhagavatu Pupa Bhagana Makaram Karumase Namutasa Bhagavatu Harahatu Samma Sambutasa Namutasa Bhagavatu Harahatu Samma Sambutasa Namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambhutasa. Can we bow again? Then we go to the precepts, to the five precepts. Do you know what to do, um? Mayam ayetisaranena saha pancha silani yachama dutiam pi mayam ayetisaranena saha pancha silani yachama tatiam pi mayam ayetisaranena saha Pancha silani yachama. Namo tassa bhagavato varahato samma sambhutasa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddham saranam gachami Buddham saranam gachami Dhammam saranam gachami Dhammam saranam gachami Sangham saranam gachami Sangham saranam gachami Duttiyam pi buddham saranam gachami Duttiyam pi buddham saranam gachami Duttiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami Duttiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami Duttiyam pi sangham saranam gachami Dutiyam bi sangham saranam gachami. 
Tatiampi Bhutam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Bhutam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Ti Sarana Gamana Nitwitam. Ama I. Pana ti pata we ratmani sika padam samariyami. Pana ti pata we ramani sika padam samadiyami. You say it in English? I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana we ratmani sika padam samadiyami. Adina dana we ramani sika padam samadiyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara we ratmani sika padam samadiyami. Kame sumi chachara we ramani sika padam samadiyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musa wada we ratmani sika padam samadiyami. Musa wada we ramani sika padam samadiyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura me rayama japamaratana we ratmani sika padam samadiyami. Sura me raya maja pamadatana veramani sikapadam samadiyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikapadani silena sugatinyanti silena boga sampada silena ni botinyanti ta samasilang wisotaye. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, <clears throat> we praised the Buddha. We took the five precepts. And hopefully this has been um, enough to bring the mind into the present moment and to bring a bit of peace from all our worldly preoccupations. So um, what we can do now, we, uh, I will give you uh, some guidance. Uh, we do a meditation for about, uh, it's about, yeah, 10 to, 10 to 7, so we can meditate until about 20 to 7, 20 past 7, yeah, about half an hour, okay? And uh, the first thing you do is you um, uh, bring your mind to what you're doing now, which is right now you are, uh, you will be sitting either on a chair or on the floor, right? And you sit cross-legged or just um, the feet on the ground, feet on the, on the floor while you're sitting on a chair or an armchair. And bring your uh, hands and uh, arms, uh, hands on your lap, okay? Or on your knee. Basically, on what, wherever it's comfortable for you, you know? We don't have to torture ourselves with a particular posture. We can just sit comfortably and in a relaxed manner. All I will uh, point out is the that the spine your spine should be straight not tense but elongated i would say and usually it's a start from the lower back huh? you don't have to stretch your head up lower back up the muscle in your tummy and the um you know you close your eyes gently you uh, check whether your chin is um, raised up in front, which um, 
unfortunately shorten the back of your neck if you do this you kind of tense the back of your neck so it's a matter of having the neck fairly upright without going up or down and you just spend a bit of time feeling out what's happening to you right now on a kind of um, you know on a, at, at the level you know fairly immediate level which means um, you just notice the posture the body posture you notice any tension in your body any feeling of well-being pleasant feeling or tension and maybe stress in the body which creates pain in your muscles or your back or your neck or wherever you may come from you know from a day of work so you may have maybe a bit of a headache so you just notice gently you are witnessing the experience that arise in the present moment as you bring your attention to your body you don't have to go anywhere it's a constant relaxation even though your state of attentive vigilance is still very present it's very important to remain awake vigilant and energetic Sometimes one can do this by um, paying attention in a way that we call it like sweeping meditation. It's like you sweep with your quality of awareness, you sweep through the whole body from the top of your head onto your feet, just noticing the life of your bodily sensation, of your maybe the restlessness restless feeling, tiredness, heaviness, and all their opposites. You may have your thoughts coursing through your mind, but right now just continue to focus on your body, the contact of your body with the floor, with the place you're sitting on. So stay with the body for a few minutes. Relaxing your face at the same time, relaxing your when you sweep your body with mindfulness, after a while you will see clearly how this quality of awareness has a capacity to relax the body. 
I call it sometimes creating space in the body. So tightness, it creates, it begins to create a sense of spaciousness. Make sure that your mind doesn't get sort of tight, over focused, over concentrated. For the time being, just leave your mind relaxed and open and spacious. You may have stories of the day or past encounters or perhaps planning your next holidays. There's nothing wrong with that. You just, as you become aware of this, you will notice that they're transient nature. If we're not aware of these things, they tend to settle down and then we engage with them without even wanting to, but because they are just not seen properly, then you just kind of, your mind gets in a state of sticking to them, something sticky. So if you bring a, a, a relaxed attention on them, you will see that 
you may not change as quickly as you want, but that's not the, the point to push things, you know, to see them go. But you just relax and you find that as you bring the knower mind, the awareness of, into the picture, and that powerful view from awareness seem to teach you very quickly the quality of anicca. Now you can just continue by just, you know, noticing whatever is arising in the present moment, whether it's thinking, stories, bodily sensations, sense contact, feeling of cold, heat, emotional feelings, anger, stress, frustration, all these things you begin to have a way of seeing them that give you quite a new perspective on things. You may see suddenly stress as something that is distant for you. You can see it, you can feel it, but you're not sucked into it. The same with anger. You can see your anger, you can see, you can get to know the experience of anger, but this knowing is, um, there is compassion and peace in the, the knowing mind to see things as they are, neutral almost. So you don't have to push things away or get stuck into wanting things differently or get rid of them or judge them or criticize them, whatever. You don't need to do all this. You can begin to see the critical judgmental mind it's just a, a state of mind, just a series of thoughts. <coughs> Rather than through terrible mishap, I've done some doing something wrong, etc., etc. Let the mind be as it is.
<clears throat> it takes effort to stay awake and vigilant. But <clears throat> I'd like to remind you that the practice is also you are befriending your mind. You're not trying to go to war with what happens in the mind. You're befriending, you get to know the mind. And that takes patience, that takes a gentle approach, a kind approach.
Now you can you can begin to open your eyes gently. You can stretch your body, change posture to enable the legs or your arms or your back to relax. And this is the end of the formal meditation practice. Good, isn't it, to sit quietly for a little while. You can see the immediate result of a mind that just disentangled itself from itself. <laughs> it disentangled itself from the activities of the mind for a little while. Just, uh, you know, the habitual activities of the mind of worrying, thinking, overthinking. So this is a good thing. We can begin to see the mind it also needs rest. Lots of rest. <clears throat> In fact, Vipassana is actually a, a hard work for the mind. But before I start my talk on the topic coming, I will just uh, do the, the <clears throat> traditional taking refuge. Namutasa vyavatu ahatu samma sambutasa. Namutasa vyavatu ahatu samma sambutasa. Namutasa vyavatu ahatu samma sambutasa. Buddham dhammam sangyam namasam. I just came across the teaching of the Buddha, which I really liked, even though I haven't read this teaching for a while. But it's called the, the Four Wonderful Things, because it's not just, um, you will see how it can be applied in our own mind. So it says as a kind of external things, but it's something that we can also use in our daily life. So I can't read all the teaching, but the main part, you know. Four wonderful and marvelous things appear, okay? When there is a manifestation of Tathagata, the Arahat, the perfectly enlightened one, the Buddha. Four wonderful and marvelous things appear. What form? People, for the most part, delight in attachment, take delight in attachment and rejoice in attachment. But when the Dhamma of non-attachment is taught by the Tathagata, by the Buddha, people wish to listen to it, lend an ear and try to understand it. And the second one, people, for the most part, <clears throat> delight in conceit, take delight in conceit, rejoice in conceit. But when the Dhamma is taught by the Tathagata for the abolition of conceit, people wish to listen to it, to lend an ear and, to <clears throat> and try to understand it. The third one, people for most part delight in restlessness. That's not an unknown state of mind, isn't it? <laughs> they delight in restlessness, but when the Dhamma of peace is taught by the Tathagata, 
people wish to listen to it, lend an ear and try to understand. And the fourth one, the fourth wonderful and marvelous thing, for people for the most part live in ignorance, are blinded by ignorance, fettered by ignorance. But when the Dharma is taught by the Tathagata for the abolition of ignorance, people wish to listen to it, to lend an ear and try to understand. And when I, was, when I came across this by chance, it makes you realize even in one's practice sometimes, our mind is turned away to worldly matters again and again, you know, through our job, our responsibility, the demands of life, the stress we have and so on. So the, the pull towards worldly matters is very powerful in our life. And but when we, if you can, can, you know, we don't have a physical Buddha in our day and age, but we can look at the, the Dharma. How do we get interested in the Dharma? You know, when our mind is curious, question life, get interested in understanding life, then it's like getting connected with a, a, an aspect of a mind which has you know, the Buddha, uh, the, the kind of, the, the Buddha wish to free the mind, okay? It's not a person, né? it's more the mind that the refuge in the Buddha, remember, when you talk about refuge in the Buddha, it's not, you know, you can take refuge in the Buddha as a man who lived 2,500 years ago, but you can also see it, as many teachers have taught me, you, and, I notice this is how tr how true this is to cultivating the mind that is, uh, you know, that has the awareness, the knowledge, the interest to see things, following what the Buddha discovered himself. To have faith, to have confidence in what he is talking about, and it's not a blind faith. It's very quick. You you very quickly you get to see what the Buddha is talking about. It doesn't need, doesn't need months and years of developing trust. When he say that, you know, your mind is painful, I think most of us can relate to the time when the mind has been painful. Uh, things change and we can't hold on to them. I think most of us have been experiencing just from young age to old age to, you know, we have constant change of the body and mind. We keep losing the past. We keep uh, moving into an uncertain future. So the Buddha said it's uncertain. Everything is uncertain. Anicca. It's transient. You can't hold on to anything. That's part of uncertainty. And then, you know, when the Buddha talks about, a, let's say, the list of the five hindrances, you know, we can make, we, we know what that means straight away. You know, it's like, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, desire for sense pleasures. You know, I mean, part of the list of the, the, the hindrances, you know, restlessness and worry, right? Sloth and torpor, and then hatred, anger, and then doubt. I don't think I've forgotten any. Yeah. So all these things are so easy to access, isn't it? Even though this is a Buddha, full enlightened Buddha who is teaching. He's not teaching about matters that we can't understand. We, we get to know these things very quickly, rapidly. And this is why what we call trust or sadha on Pali, this sadha, you know, manifests with, it, with easily because it's so much part of our daily experience so much part of our experience of life. And so when I read these four wonderful, marvelous things that appear when the, dialogue, when the Buddha is here, I also, I can bring this to my own experience. When, for example, um, you know, let's say 
there's a part of us that really love restlessness and agitation, excitement. Isn't it true? I've seen that in myself. In fact, I was so addicted to excitement that I couldn't imagine ever living a peaceful life, which seemed to be another word for dullness, you know, for something not interesting, nothing exciting. So what? I'm going to be, I feel like dead. What's the problem? Not me. But in fact, when we turn the, the mind towards a meditative mind, towards a contemplative mind, towards, you know, this comes very naturally when we sense that we have a, a, in part of us is a mind that is aware and that is has knowledge that we did not know before right as i said in other talks you know for 32 years of my life i never knew things were changing of course i could see they were changing all the time but I never used it as a contemplation to pose myself to, to, to stabilize this mind for a little while and observe things with the quality of mindfulness, with the quality of awareness, with the quality of peace in my heart. Something very stable, something very relaxed, you know, with looking at life as it is. Most of us, for many, many years, we've just been, in a way, jumping on this, uh, you know, the vehicle of life's tri um, tribulations. You know, we are hooked on this vehicle of tribulations. We up and down and up and down and turn around and swept around and so on, you know, instead of turning to the Dharma, which is your refuge of stability and the refuge of peace. So conceit, everybody knows what conceit is, you know, and it's what well, it, it, that's more difficult to see, much more difficult to see. It's called conceit. Conceit is really so much part of our skin. Only when somebody tells you that you're wrong, will you notice it, you know, when you're attached to right, you'll see how your mind can easily come with a conclusion, I know better than them. Who are they to tell me what to do? I'm better than them. Who do they think they are? I'm superior. I have more knowledge. I'm more beautiful, more handsome. I'm richer, wealthier than them. I'm more successful. I'm brilliant. They are just nothing much. <laughs> and there's a, an, a shadow of conceit, is the reverse of conceit when you start feeling sorry for other people's life all the time. You, you, it's very easy to love people who is uh, below you than to love people who are above you, quote unquote, you know, in life. People, relationship can go well when somebody thinks they are really helping you. You notice. They think you are, you are, you are their savior. Or you think you are their savior. And they think they are their, your savior. But when we come to the place where we're more equal, when maybe one of the person in the couple or the, the, the relationship is more successful, let's say, that becomes much more difficult. Then that's a conceit can, you know, manifest very strongly. I'm better than you now. I don't need you. So, um, you know, conceit is, is, a, is a very painful thing. It's the ego, has a, one of the quality of the, you know, the, that kind of mass of self that we, uh, trying to understand and disentangle ourselves from is a mass, I used to say from experience, I remember seeing clearly this sense of self. I call it ego. It's not a bad thing, you know. I used to say to my student, don't complain about your ego. That's all, that's all you have to get enlightened. So bow to it. Actually, thank your ego because that's your teacher. 
without it, you would not know what to do. <laughs> so the ego is not something to judge or something to dislike or so. No, it's just like an unfortunate mass of stuff that really is kind of, uh, what would you say, it's a bit obsolete, you know, and it's just doing things that it doesn't know how to do anymore, do you know what I mean? But it's been useful for a long, long time for all of us, our conditioned self has really helped us a lot. We can't deny it, you know. But at some point it becomes, you know, you begin to see it's not really attuned to the reality of life. It's always going back to past memories or to a projection from the past or projection who stop, you know, instead of seeing things as they are. So, you know, and then the Buddha talks about ignorance. Four wonderful things that appear when the Buddha is, you know, is that when we see ignorance and the Buddha is around, the Buddhist teaching, I could see, then suddenly there's an interest, you know, suddenly we want to learn, we want to really we get motivated to learn the Buddhist teaching. So this is the four things that really motivates us to turn to the Buddhist teaching or to turn to Buddha's wisdom. Yeah. Sometimes we like, let's say we like a uh, motivation, you know, we don't know what we feel depressed or it's not working. Uh, the Buddha is not excited. Buddhist teaching is not exciting enough. I don't get really insight. I've been, you know, you know really kind of uh, uh, not seeing any change or anything like that. So this is, uh, you know, a part of the mind that gets discouraged. Yeah. And if you see clearly this sense of discouragement or the thoughts of discouragement, which many people have, we get discouraged. Life is a very big discouraging experience at times, you know. And so no wonder that we have this kind of uh, mentality when we feel depressed and discouraged and hopeless sometimes, you know. But then we have these four wonderful and marvelous things appear. The Buddha is not cool, that cool, They're wonderful and marvelous, you know. In the English dictionary, that would maybe appear like a bit over the top, wouldn't it? Wonderful and marvelous, you know, the Buddha talks to you and say, <laughs> well, he's a bit emotional, you know. <laughs> it's a bit over the top. Lord Buddha. <laughs> but then we hear it from this very wise being, isn't it great? When we have attachment, which is the first one he talked about, you know, no, we take a lot of delight in being attached. Our relationship, when they love somebody, you get really cling to them, don't they? When you have a nice dress, you know, and somebody's taking it away, you really get upset because you want it back. Or when somebody, again, um, tell you you're stupid and you're identified, you know, you're really clinging to the sense of self as being clever and intelligent. That's not going to go down very well, is it? When somebody say you're an idiot. Or you're not very, you know, smart, really. <laughs> I'm smarter than you. There we are. We're attached. Do you understand? Somebody says, you're too short. I like tall people. You feel offended, don't you? Who is it to take me that? I mean, to tell me this. My mother made me like this, so what's the problem with you? My mother loved me, just small and petite and sweet looking. <laughs> My mother loved me, why do you tell me this? So you remember the good feeling your mom gave you. You're a bit attached to that, maybe. And then somebody criticizes you, and then you're attached to being critical. That's not up to you to tell me what to do or how I am. So attachment, I don't think we need a lot of information to find out directly without thinking even what attachment is about. It's the most rampant 
to the, the most rampant state of mind in the human world, you know. I don't know, so, so human are made like that, you know, you see it in, in animals, I mean, animals, you know, they get attached to human beings when they look after them, you notice that? Huh? They get, as if it was their parents, their mother, their father. So attachment is not a bad thing. It becomes painful when it makes your life miserable. Sometimes we need to cling to things a little bit, you know. Ajahn Sachito, when we started uh, tra being trained by Ajahn Sachito, which all of you maybe know, he was our mother superior for about six years. We didn't have a, a nun, we had a monk, the toughest monk in the community. And he used to say, you let go of everything except your robe and your arms ball. <laughs> cling to them. <laughs> Not because he suits, he thought we were going to throw our robe and go naked in the street of London. That's not what he meant. He meant just make sure you, you keep them, make sure you look after them, make sure these are your requisites. Yeah, this is what you, that's what you have to dress and walk the world. And that's what you have to receive arms food and to eat every day. So <laughs> let go of everything, but cling to your arms bowl and your robes. I don't know if you re would remember that, but I'm, I'm being struck by this, I remember. <clears throat> so when the Buddha says those wonderful and marvelous things, it means that every time we like the attachment, we may delight, we may rejoice, and, and we may, uh, you know, in, in, in those experience, or we may, um, yeah, each experience we may delight and rejoice in them, whether it's attachment, whether it's conceit, where there is stress, a restlessness, or ignorance. But when the Buddha is around, either through his teachings or through his, um, you know, through the, the inner Buddha, so the part of, our, of us who is able to see things as they are too, like the Buddha, then we also naturally turn towards that uh, part of the Buddha we know the teachings and our own experience of the mind that is uh, able to witness, to be a witness, to be a mirror, to see things as they are. So instead even thoughts, I mean, in most tradition, thoughts are not, seen, are not seen as a sixth sense. So the Buddha makes it so easy and of course difficult as well because we're attached to our thinking naturally. It's not easy to let go of our thinking. But what he says, thinking is also an object of the mind, something you can look at, something you can let go. You can live with a mind that has no thoughts and survive <laughs> quite well. You know, your, your thoughts that you have in your mind most of the time are very habitual, habitual thoughts. They come from a, a, a kind of conditioning related to thinking and they keep coming back. All story keep going back. It's just habits, you know, coming back. But when my mind is empty, now I'll tell you a little story. I thought I'd tell you this story, but I don't know how you would come into the picture. <laughs> now I know when I'm going to tell you the story because it's a sweet story. When I was in Thailand in the forest, I was really quite alone. And I had a kuchi, and uh, there was lots of snakes and lots of different things, you know. But one day when I was um, meditating in my kuchi in the afternoon, when it's, it's so hot, even the insects don't, can't make much noise. They're too tired. They, do, uh, they have a little siesta, you know, because the forest is very noisy in Thailand. And at some point I heard a shriek, incredible loud shriek, you know as if somebody who had their throat cut off, you know. And I wasn't frightened for some reason, you know, because the mind was peaceful. And I just curious, what is this shriek comes from, you know? And then I got up slowly, I looked through my window and I saw a big black snake. And inside the black snake's mouth was a little green frog. You know, the French are called the froggies. 
so I immediately related to her. I never knew this when I was in France, but since I'm in England, I know I'm a froggy. In any case, when I saw this little frog, just to show you how thoughts work, I didn't think. I knew exactly what to do. I said my mind on its own without me prompting it. Candles, drop it on the head of the snakes. I didn't know what snake it was, what kind of snake it was. Drop it on the snake's head and it'll be so surprised it'll open its mouth and the frog will jump. Now, this was not happening in words, do you understand? It's just knowledge, you knew that was going to happen. And, and that's exactly what I did. I took a little tight handles like this. I was on the half a floor, so I was not next to the, the snakes. And I dropped it right in the middle of his skull, just right here. It opened its mouth and the frog jumped. By golly, she was happy, I think. But the snakes wasn't happy at all. I had no idea what kind of snake it was. And I was used to snakes, so I wasn't frightened particularly. But when I saw it going through my kuti, I saw the, 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 the body of the snake doing this, like that. And I didn't even think what it was. I just said, wow, that snake is really strong to make such a kind of arch of his back, you know. <laughs> I didn't think he was doing yoga, but. <laughs> And then because, you know, as this is just a story to show you that the mind can think without you having to carry around the habits of your thoughts. Well, I finished the story because it's quite sweet. Yeah, I, I used to do a, a chant for the Creepy Curly, which is part of our book. The chant in our book is there, so you can have a look. Virupa, ke, hime, me, he, etc., etc. It's a meta chant for all the creepy crawlies that the student of the Buddha met when he was alive. For the biped, the, the quadruped, the centiped, the no, no, no pause, you know, all the creepy crawlies. There's this beautiful chant of meta, which and which end gloriously with a. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and so on. So I used to chant this every day, fortunately. I said, what if I get eaten up or, you know, stunned by some deadly things? At least I would have done my work, you know. I, I can do that much. After that, you know, I, I, I can't predict. So I started, when I saw the, the snake was under my scooty, I started, you know, I'd done it already in the morning. I did it in the afternoon, <laughs> three o'clock in the afternoon. And I, um, you know, I, I also spoke at the, after the finishing the chanting, I said, you can go, you are in peace. There's safety. You don't need to worry about anything. You, you know, you are, you are safe, et cetera, et cetera. I have to say my face was very strong at the time about these things because living in Thailand for nearly three years, I remember it's Thailand is, uh, it completely, um, has a particular world in a way that they always think that the animals have a relationship with human beings and they think that the animals know about the karma. So I'm, I'm raised as a samana or as a monk or a nun. I am in this culture that thinks that the animals know about karma and if you're a good nun or a good monk, you know, then they won't harm you. And many monks in Thailand have never been harmed by animals, you know, because they had no fear. You see, the, the animals are very frightened of fear of other people. And then, um, so, you know, after a while I looked at it and I saw it slithering back into the forest, but I was curious. I said, how many meters, you know? So uh, three meters, one meter is three feet. So nine feet. So I said to myself, wow, oh my God, that's a big, I still didn't think what it was, you know, that's a big snake. And then at tea time, I decided to go and see my teacher and check. <laughs> I don't mind animals as long as they're not going to kill me on the day. <laughs> so I, he said, well, tell me, describe me the, the snakes. 
when I said I counted about three meters, so he looked at me, uh, which color? Black, king cobra. <laughs> he said, king cobra. You know, he never come back, it never crossed my mind that he was a king cobra. If I known, I'd heard so many stories about king cobras by the monks. You know, they see you, they kill you instantly. The, all the farmers have a gun and when they see a king cobra, they kill it immediately. Do you know what I mean? But in the monastery, no, there, there, there are lots of king cobra. I never met one before, that was the first one. And nobody, not, none of the monks are frightened. In fact, even when they have a viper, you know, a very deadly viper, they have a little bed because she's having all the little baby vipers at the bottom of the steps and say, please do not disturb. <laughs> this is a world of the forest life. And I loved it because I, I just feel it's so beautiful, you know, to look at the world in that way. So that's my story. Just to show you how the mind can think about things without you thinking. We see this in our life, don't we? Where we instantly know what to do, you know? Without having to think and worry for hours about what to do. You notice that? <coughs> yeah? So, you can remember the most wonderful things and going back to the Buddhist teaching I was talking about. And then next to the page is a teaching, those two teachings I've read it many, many times, many years ago. I love those teachings. And you can see <laughs> on my book, they have a pink, a pink sign of them. You know, I was so interested in them. And the other, the other one is here. This is my book. I can do what I want with it. <laughs> so, and so, yeah, it's in the book called The Buddha's Words, by the way, for those who want to have it. It's a beautiful book. And at the back, it says, before my, for you, maybe, maybe I say this because maybe you're not, never come across this text from the Buddha. Before my enlightenment, O oh monks, while I was still a bodhisattva, bodhisattva, it occurred to me, what is the gratification of the world? What is the danger of the world? What is the, what is the escape from the world? And the world is what we create. It's our world. Our mind is the world. You understand? And of course, it manifests in the life, not the life. The hum human world is life. Yeah, but basically it comes from our own mind. So whatever pleasure and joy there is in the world, this is gratification of the world. That the world is impermanent, bound up with suffering and subject to change. This is the danger of the world. The removal and abandoning of desire and lust for the world, that is the escape from the world. So the Buddha continues, so long, so long, monks, as I did not directly know, as they really are, the gratification of the world as gratification, its danger as danger, and the escape from the world as escape. For so long, I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, mara, brahmas, in this population with its ascetic and brahmin, its devas and human. But when I directly knew all this, then I claimed to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its deva, etc., up down to humans. So the Buddha was not uh, criticizing the gratification of the world. He was not criticizing, criticizing, you know, that we shouldn't suffer or suffer or whatever, uh, or that we have, you know, no lust or no desire. It's just when I saw desire as it is, then I, I abandoned it, you know. 
So, this is maybe what I have to offer to you tonight. And hopefully you can maybe find this book, which is beautiful, and read, you know, quietly in your heart, without any plans, just read it and let your consciousness, let your Buddha mind, uh, your reflective mind, bring the wisdom to understand these things deeply in silence, usually. Yeah? So now if you have some question, I'm very happy to help you with your question. Um, Ajahn, um, it's easy to relate to people when they're in a good situation, but how do you stop worrying about people who are in a very bad situation? You know, um, hang on. I like to have, I'm going to respond to your question if I don't forget it, but what I would be interested in is to have you writing your question on the side of the screen. Uh, Marlon, could you do something about that? So that so John, if, if, if you could write your question in, um, I can pass it over to Ajahn Sundara. Thank you. And I, do I need to see all the participants? Yes, I suppose that's fine. Yeah. So it's easy. Can you repeat the question? Now, by now, with all the <laughs> talking, no. oh, write it down because uh, right now there is no space, by the way, to share the screen to write it down. Marlon, there is no space on the screen to share the to share the question written down. Um, it, it should come into you through the chat. I'll show you how it will look. Well, uh, it's oh, chat. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. But nothing comes up. Oh, okay. Test, yeah. We will be starting shortly. Thank you for your patience. What's that? Okay. So um, the person who just asked me the question, could you repeat it for me, please? Yes, I can accept when people are happy and relate to them. But how do I cope when people I love are very unhappy? How do I cope with that? difficult. Yeah, it's not easy. If you want to cope with them, as you say, maybe the word cope is not what's going to help you. Mm. How can you understand, maybe if you touch into your wisdom, what is it that disturbs me about them? Well, I talk to them and listen to what is causing their unhappiness, but I can't really help them. I sympathize with them. Can you accept the fact, maybe, that you are unable to help them? Really what does that do? What, how does that affect you, the fact that you feel helpless to help them? Because I'm not able to tell them the teachings of the Buddha because often they're Christians or other uh, denominations, so I can't tell them what I think. Now tell me, this person has a religion? Yes. What, what uh, religion? A Christian. A Christian. You'll never help a Christian with a Buddhist teaching, no. because the teaching of the Buddha, the relationship of the teaching to suffering, and the suffering in the Christian tradition, maybe the end product may be the same, but the actual teaching deal with it very differently. Yeah. So you have to be careful because, you know, for some Christian, the trust in Christ is more important than trying to understand the, teach, the, the suffering as the Buddha uh, yeah. teaches us, you know. Yeah. So you... you the, what, what do you think would help? Do you, do you, this person who is miserable, she maybe needs to 
find a confidence in her own religion. Do you understand? Maybe she has lost touch with what inspired us, her at some time in her life. But, well, she's got a great faith and believes in God. She's a, a Christian scientist. She doesn't believe in medicine. She's a Christian scientist. Chris, do you know Christian science? Um, but she's very loving towards other people. Yeah. But I can't tell her about Buddhism. It wouldn't mean anything. Now, do you, does she, is she asking for you to teach her Buddhism? No. no, no. <laughs> there is something that the Buddha even warned the monks and the nuns during this lifetime. Don't teach people unless they ask you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We are breaking a rule if we do this. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. I accept that. Mm. So, you know, to help people, forget about your religion, forget about what you know. Yeah. But just um, forget, you know, don't force people to talk to you if they can't. Don't force people to share something with you they might still be confused about. Do you understand? They might still not know how to express themselves. But what you can do, the energy of love, the loving energy in one's heart, mm. I could say, I think, has miraculous effect. <laughs> By a miraculous, I mean unexpected effect. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. Things happen we didn't expect. Yeah. It's subconsciously, I think that's the case, because she understands me and I understand her. So in a way, t her talking about the problems is good. But I still, she I still suffer from her being unhappy. You suffer too? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least you can start using the Buddhist teaching yourself. And by yourself cultivating the understanding that the Buddha is presenting to us, you might actually alter the situation. Yeah. Mm. So this is your step. That's what you need to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. I understand what you're saying. Do you understand? I do. The fact okay. that you are liberating yourself from the burden and uh, the weight of your own suffering. Yeah. She might respond to you in a very differently suddenly. Yeah. I want to hear that next time, next uh, when you come back in September. Yes, I will try. Thank you very much. Much, okay. much appreciate it. So there's a good evening, Ajahn. Of the senses, sight seems to be the one that gives me the greatest sense of self and sense of me inside and an object outside. Do you have any tip for meditating, contemplating sight? Yes, many tips. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of that when I was um, a younger nun because I noticed the power of sight, you know, the power of the eyes to contact the world. You, you know, we, when we don't practice, when we don't, when we don't have a teacher that helps us to take refuge in awareness, what happens? We don't really explore our mind. We don't explore our life. That's why we feel miserable because we are, we are meant to explore. The Buddha even talks about understanding, even in his own simple words, you know, understand. So, um, Whatever object you are attracted to, you can look at it with mindfulness and you will see very quickly, if you do it well, I mean, if you take this mindfulness, you know, sustain mindfulness, you will see that your eyes are only the result of your mind inside. Oh. The eyes is no problem. But what goes on in your mind is what creates your experience of the eyes. That's called the sense, the, 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 the visual sense. 
So what happened is when you are mindful, when you look at something that bothers you, like for example, and this I got from the teaching of Ajahn Sumedho, the teaching sometime Ajahn Suchito, I saw him doing that as well, working, you know, and not many people talk about it actually. I've never seen other teachers talk about it. Only Ajahn Sumedho talk about using mindfulness in that way. You would be looking, for example, at something you know, you don't like. And by bringing mindfulness to that looking, what happens? Your mind is beginning to lose its power of attachment. Yep. As you bring awareness, the, 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 the stickiness of your mind to the consciousness, you know, the, 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 your mind's kind of glued together or attached, you could say, with whatever you're looking at, okay, is uh, either fall is due category, I like or I don't like, is great, it's awful, is bad, is painful, is wonderful, is awful, and so on. So I did a lot of that, looking at people I did not like, for example. I would look at them because I would be sitting in front of them. I didn't have to change my posture. So they did not know I was looking at them particularly because I was just looking quite broad and kind of in the void, so to speak, almost. But I was also meditating with that vision. Do you understand? I was, they did not know what I was doing. I was meditating and feeling, knowing what was going on in me as I was looking at the face of this person which I found difficult and didn't like. What happened? Little by little, my mind became quite neutral. And eventually, the interest disappeared because we can have interest because we dislike something or we can have interest because we like something, both sides. Do you understand? So you may be with a person you'll find really difficult to be with, Okay, and then you can just begin to meditate on the perception of that person, on the thoughts about that person, on the feeling, the, 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 the mood that this person brings to you, etc. So it's the same, it's just a meditation practice. Yeah, where's the person who asked me this question? Is she here? Hello? gone yes thank you sorry thank you Ajahn thank you that's very helpful thank you was it well yeah okay is that enough yes thank you that's really okay. useful thank you so the next question is is it practical and useful for westerners lay people to go to Thailand for a retreat and do you have recommendation where to go please <laughs> You want to have a little push to tell you, yeah, go for it. <laughs> I, I was worried about the snakes. Well, don't worry. I've no, I've, I've survived the snakes. <laughs> many of my friends survived the snakes. Many of my students survived snakes in Thailand. Don't worry. It's nothing. I was frightened of snakes too. And but when you're there, it's very different. Your mind. Uh, uh, kind of distant from the object of your fear, create a lot more things than when you're right there with it, you know. Do you understand? When you see a snake right next to you, you know exactly what to do. <laughs> you don't need to be frightened. <laughs> you just move away as fast as you can. No, don't worry. I will go to Thailand. It's a beautiful country. You have wonderful teachers, wonderful teachings. It's an amazing place. Yeah, go. You will do a retreat. Are there some places that you would say some places to go on retreat which are more suitable for, for Westerners than others? Do you mean they have less less snakes? <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> Don't worry. Everybody is like you. We don't we don't you yeah, no exception. People are always frightened of snakes, you know. But once you, I mean, maybe not everybody, but um, yeah, but you know, all the places in Thailand are, are really safe, very safe, don't worry. 
the retreat center. Many Westerners go to Thailand, you know, so they are very well looked after. You know, even myself, I went to I went to spend over a month in a most will in the greatest wilderness of Thailand on the border of Thai, of Burma, 20 minutes walk from Burma. There was nothing there. I was in the middle of nowhere. I was I had been invited to be to do a retreat with the monks from Wat Panana Chat by Ajanja Yasaro. And um, anyway, that's a long story, but I survived on a bamboo platform for nearly five weeks alone. <laughs> when, I, when I thought of being in a bamboo platform, just to tell you the difference between the mind in certain situation and in other situation. So when I was in a monastery, people say, don't you want to try to sleep outside? So I pretended I was cool, you know. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> and inside, no way I'm going to do that, you know. I'm too frightened of snakes. And then I ended up on the bamboo platform in the, in the middle of a virgin forest, seven hours away from civilization. And uh, I was the happiest person I've ever met in myself. I absolutely adored the time I was there, I had there. Now, if I had thought about it from Bangkok, I would never see myself happy in that position. But for some reason, this forest was magic. I loved it. And I was very isolated. You know, the monks were quite close to each other. So I'm not taking you, I'm, I'm telling you the story because I love this time I spend in Thailand, in those places particularly. And uh, but what I'm telling you is what you anticipate is nothing real, do you understand? This is for you generally, just in general. Mm. What we anticipate has nothing to do with the reality of you when you're there in another place, you understand? And that you can apply it for almost everything in your life. The mind imagines a lot of things, you know, which seems so real. And so many times I've been proved the contrary. So we finished. Thank you. Next one, dear Ajahn, thank you for being here tonight. My question is there also positive attachment. My, my, my question is, is there pos also positive attachment? Can there be attachment to the Dharma? Yeah, <laughs> it's a lovely question. Yeah, of course, it can be very positive attachment. <laughs> In fact, we have one attachment which is allowed, depending on which translation you have. There is one sutta, which has a de de ver various translators. The first translator translated it as one lovely attachment. That was by Prakantipalo, who disrobed since then, one of the first Westerners to translate within the last 30, 40 years from Thai or Pali into English. So he used to call it one lovely attachment. I love that. I love that translation. I said, look, you see, the Buddha allows one lovely attachment and it, we have it in our chanting book. Please take your chanting book. If I can find mine. Yeah, yeah. Take your chanting book on page. It has another title. It's not another title here. Yeah. It's in a chanting and it's called, it's a very short, Hang on. I will find it. Wow. Okay. Let me see in the in the title. Uh, 
it's in the reflection. You can have a look. We have it for sure. So the first one will find it. Let me know. It's about, uh, you know, there is no bargaining with Mara. Nick, you know, you don't know where it would be, would you? Yeah. Oh, one shiny. It's called on the shiny night of prosperity. <laughs> Prakantipalo translated one lovely attachment. You can see the difference between translators. And it's, it's a, the teaching is like, one should not revive the past, nor speculate on what's, this, what's to come. The past is left behind, the future is unrealized. In every, can you move it up a bit? Okay, in every presently arisen state, there, just there, one clearly sees unmoved, unagitated, such insight is one's strength. Ardently doing one's task today, tomorrow, who knows, death may come. Facing the mighty hordes of death, of Mara, indeed one cannot strike a deal. To dwell with energy aroused, thus for a night of non-decline, that is a night of shining prosperity. So it was taught by the peaceful sage that mm -hmm. refers to the Buddha. Shining prosperity. So that's the, you can be attached. I mean, Prakantipalo had it slightly different, um, translated slightly differently, uh, you know, more fitting with his title. It's that basically, don't make bargain with, with the army of Bara, Amara, just, do, you know, stay awake, prepare yourself for the fact life is unknown. You could die anytime, you know. Okay. Are you, are you okay with the response or do you want a bit more, uh, you know, uh, investigation? That was lovely, Ajahn. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Um, Thank but, you. you know, but, but to go back to maybe a more, you know, immediate experience of our daily life, you know. Uh, you could be attached maybe, you know, attachment are only wrong when they start making you suffer and, and, and you begin to see that they blind you. You see, attachment keeps you in the past. Be okay. careful. They keeps you hooked on past experience. Yes. And maybe prevent you from moving forward. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh yes, it does, yes. Because that is neither past nor future. That's just attachment to the Dhamma in the here and now. Well, is you that... don't have to see attachment to the Dhamma. You can just see, you see the Dhamma in the here and now. Oh yes, that's much better, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As you find it much better, then you go back to it without being attached because once you've seen it, once you have awakened to the Dhamma, it's very difficult to fall asleep. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, might you. Need, you might need to have a little bit of a, you know, a push from time to time, but it's very difficult to forget the joy of seeing things as they are. Even if it is painful to get them, Yes. And it can be sometimes damn pain painful, very painful. Yeah, that too. <laughs> because letting go of attachment is really hard. You know? Yes. So don't expect a life of, um, you know, the processing attachment to non-attachment to be easy. It's not easy to let go of things we like, for example. It's not easy to abandon things that are dear to us, that, are, that, that we find not just that, but we think we could not live without certain things. Do you understand? Yes. We might die. We might die if we let go of these things. So it takes a lot of, you know, not just courage, but confidence, trust, you know, that you're going in a direction that's supporting your life rather than threatening your life. It's called faith, you know, in a way. Okay. Another questions? 
I don't know. I think we're coming to the end of it. Huh? Okay, well, if we come to the end of it, I thought maybe uh, I'll uh, mention that uh, this is the last class of um, the summer season. Yeah. So uh, we have, um, I think it start again on next 7th of September, is that it? Right. So everybody will be fresh and suntanned and <laughs> relaxed. And I'm joking. I know many people will, be, will have been working quite hard in August. So during this time, during the, the months of August, you know, you can continue to make the, your practice of Dharma a joyful, um, a joyful perception rather than a burden. The mind is always creating, oh, you do it one time, two times, three times after that. Oh my God, I don't think I can carry on, it's too much, you know. The perception of delusion is very powerful. It will, you know, you might have been dying to have, a, you know, a nice cheesecake for, year, for years maybe. Finally, you have one and you eat it. And somebody said the second one, you eat the second one. And the third one you want to throw up. Do you understand? Perception is once you get what you want. Yeah. You don't want to be attached to the next part of what you got and you wanted and you got it. Once you got it, the mind changed straight away. But if greed is there, then it will never be satisfied. That's the difference. The greed energy is never satisfied. It's only satisfied because you let it die. That's all. The greed itself never, never dies by itself. You have to start seeing it and not acting on it. Little by little, it dwindles. It loses its power. Or it, the mind is just lose interest in greed at some point. It still wants to eat and be satisfied and still wants things it like and so on. But the interest is a bit like Adrian Sumedo used to talk to us about, you know, when you're a little girl and you, 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 you know, you're playing pa, uh, ma, mom and dad and you have your doll and your little babies and you're this, you love it, you know, and you, 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 you'll do anything to, to be happy with, to, to have your little doll or preferably a new one if you can, you know, for Christmas or for my birthday or something. But then after, you know, after you get to the age of 10 or 12 or 14, you can care less about little dolls and prams, you know, little baby prams and so on until you get married and get a child. But that's, that's when you become much more difficult and <laughs> much harder work. So, um, be careful, you know, to not be uh, fooled by the perception of your mind. And the hardest thing, if you think you're the only one who find it hard to practice, you're not the only one. The practice is a constant, you know, a constant um, reminder of, of, you know, of doing something that the mind is very often resistant and opposed to. Even if it knows it's good, there is resistance. Unless you're well disciplined, if you're a very disciplined person, then you can do these things, it's okay, it works. But at some point, you know, maybe we, we have time when we have, we get fed up with too much discipline or you know, we want to be more free spirited or something. But with the Dhamma, if you let it die, you know, if you don't do, if you don't cultivate the Dhamma, be careful because you could end up um, being filled with a lot of unpleasant uh, state of mind, you know. I mean, your, the habits of your mind might just return or re kind of uh, regroup and get you backward, you know, into a world where you felt miserable and that misery brought you to the Dharma and then at some point you forget about it and you might just go back to the same old ruts, you know. Be, dharma is a medicine. If you don't take it at some point, you don't know. If, you're, if you don't take it and you're not yet a Buddha or an Arahant, then you might, you know, you might go backward a bit, be careful. In terms of your happiness, you might just lose a bit of happiness or confidence. 
or clarity of mind, you know, that kind of thing. So I just wish you to have a really good time whilst practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is life, remember. Maybe I give you another definition of mindfulness, you know. Mindfulness or heedfulness is a path to the deathless. That's a Buddha mind, by the way. <laughs> okay. Your Buddha nature, deathless. Heedful, heedlessness is a path to death. Those who never, uh, those who are uh, heedful never dies. Those who are heedless are as already dead. It's in the Dhammapada. It's a verse in the Dhammapada. Have a look. It's a good reflection. So in the morning, sometimes it helps me myself that without this practice, you know, my mind is left like a garden, not well attended. You know, I've forgotten to water it or to put its things in the sunshine or to give it a bit of love and attention and so on. So treat your mind as a lovely plant or a little tree with your body that needs nurturing, needs love, needs care needs attention, needs a good listening. The mind is in pain a lot of the time. You will notice that. It struggles to understand life. It doesn't know how to do it. You need your help. That's what the Buddha Dhamma is about, to help you to understand life. So, I wish you well. Is there anything else, Nick, that needs to be said? No, sister, that was, uh, Achan, that was really wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us today for the last day of the summer term. Uh, just to reaffirm what you said, that we meet again on the 7th of September, Monday the 7th of September. So thank you for coming and to wish everybody a, a good August break and see you in the beginning of the autumn. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to miss you because I, I don't see you, all of you, but uh, it seems like you are... You know, I always liked that class, the Monday class, even though I, d I stopped doing it because it was a bit too much. You know, at the time when I was very involved being a senior nun at Amrawati and activities and so on, you know, and the long journey, which was very pleasant, by the way, but still it was too much. And so we stopped it. I didn't show and I, we stopped it. But even with very few people, I loved it. You know, I really enjoy the people who join me for the Monday. So it brings me back to my years when I used to go by bus then. Take good care and wish you well. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you very much. Araham Samma Sambodho Bhagava Bodham Bhagavantam Abhivadeni Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Sangham Namami 